Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. Good morning and happy Sunday to you and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC and I'm so glad that you have tuned in for our service today. I'm delighted to be able to, to share a few thoughts with you this morning. Uh, before that, I invite you to join me as we go to God in prayer. Let me God thank you for the gift of this day and the gift of worship. We come before you seeking to honor you and to worship you. And we pray, God, that you would speak to us in powerful ways, that we might be changed, that we might be new people because of an encounter with you. We thank you for the word that you give us, and we pray, God, that we are changed as a result. And God, specifically, I pray for more of you and for less of me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have you ever known someone who experienced a radical transformation? Now, I'm not talking about somebody who changed the color of their hair, or maybe they lost a lot of weight, or, or some other outward appearance. I, I'm, I'm asking, do you know someone who has experienced a radical transformation from the inside out? Maybe it's you. Maybe you've experienced that transformation in your life, something that, that causes you to see things differently, to think about things differently, uh, to even act differently. You know, when we have an internal change, it impacts everything else about us and everything else around us. Have you ever heard the name Spud Webb? before. Now, if you're a basketball fan, you, you've probably heard this name before. Spud Webb was a professional basketball player in the 1980s. However, he wasn't your ordinary professional basketball player. In a sport where the average height was six foot eight or six foot nine, Spud Webb stood at a whopping five foot six inches. I mean, take a look at this picture here. It's definitely one of those times where I look at it and I think, well, one of these things is not like the other. Uh, you know, Webb, he was, he was a star basketball player in high school, but he, he just couldn't quite break through to any of the major college teams to play college basketball. So instead, he chose to play for a two-year community college, and he actually took that college to the junior National College Championship. Yeah, so he, he played community college, and, and he even had a hard time breaking into the NBA. But it wasn't until our own Atlanta Hawks picked him up. And, and he played for four seasons with the Atlanta Hawks, and they went to the playoffs for four times while he was with them. Well, each year in the NBA, uh, you may have seen this on, on 
ESPN or, or somewhere before, but there's a slam dunk competition where several players come together and they compete in this slam dunk challenge. And in 1986, Spud, at, Spud Webb was the shortest player in this competition. He competed against people that were at least a foot taller than he was. And at the end of the competition, Spud Webb was crowned the winner of the slam dunk challenge. Well, shortly after this, in an interview, Spud Webb gave this testimony. He said, I used to pray that the Lord would make me bigger when I was in junior high school and senior high. But every time I went to measure myself or to stand in front of the mirror, I'd always be the same size. And then one day, I got the message. So I said to the Lord, if you won't make me bigger on the outside, will you make me bigger on the inside? And the Lord liked that prayer. And that's what He's helped me become. You see, Spud Webb was changed from the inside, and it changed everything. It, it changed what he was able to do because he had that internal radical transformation. Well, today we're going to talk about someone in Scripture that had another very radical transformation, a, a transformation that impacted the spread of Christianity greater than perhaps anyone except for Jesus Christ. So our scripture lesson today comes to us from the New Testament book of Acts, chapter 9, verses 1 through 6. So hear these words. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I'm Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And we pray God's blessings on the reading of His most holy word. I mean, talk about drama. And of course, the story goes on after this, and I encourage you to read the rest of chapter 9, but this has to be one of the most dramatic stories in all of the Bible. Certainly one of the most dramatic conversion experiences we read in Scripture, and maybe even the history of the church. Well, Saul in this story later becomes Paul. So my question is, how much do you know about Paul in the Bible? We talk a lot about Paul, but how much do we really know about Paul? Well, I'd like to give you a really brief history lesson on Paul, and, and I'll try not to bore you too much as we look at Paul in this time. But let's start this way. Before Paul was Paul, he was Saul of Tarsus. He was a very well-educated young man, and he was seeking to become a rabbi. And he was a devout Jewish man. He was who was vehemently opposed to the spread of the gospel of Jesus Christ, so much opposed that he utilized violence against followers in Jesus in every effort to stop the spread of Christianity. We read in Scripture that Saul was present when Stephen, who was a devout follower of Jesus, when Stephen was stoned to death. And we know Stephen as now being the first Christian martyr. Well, in Acts chapter 7, verse 57, it says this, At this they covered their ears, and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at Stephen, dragged him out of the city, and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. And Saul 
approved of their killing him. Well, Saul was born in Tarsus. Tarsus was an affluent and diverse community that valued education. Uh, So, Saul moved from Tarsus to Jerusalem to study religion with one of the most influential rabbis of that time, and his name was Gamaliel, because Saul was wanting to become a rabbi himself. In Acts chapter 22, verse, uh, verse 3, Saul tells us a little bit more about himself. He says, I'm a Jew born in Tarsus, but brought up in this city. I, I studied under Gamaliel and was thoroughly trained in the law of our ancestors. I was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. Well, well now that we, we've learned a little bit about Saul, and of course there's a whole lot more, but just a glimpse into who Saul was, we have to ask the question, why in the world was, was he wanting to persecute Christians so intensely? Well, the short of it is Saul did not think Jesus was the Messiah. He did not believe that Jesus was truly the Messiah. So his goal was to persecute Jesus' followers so that he might help stop the spread of Christianity. Acts chapter 8 verse 3 says, but Saul began to destroy the church going from house to house. He dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. And if you and I would would have asked Saul why he was doing what he was doing, he he might say that he he was doing a service to God by attempting to stop the spread of false teaching. And Saul, like many other rabbis, believed that the law of God had to be obeyed before the Messiah could come. Well, the theologian Warren Wiersbe, he he makes this, this interesting observation about Saul. He states the following, Had you stopped him, Saul, and asked for his reasons, he might have said something like this. Jesus of Nazareth is dead. Do you expect me to believe that a crucified nobody is the promised Messiah? According to our law, anybody who is hung on a tree is cursed. Would God take a cursed false prophet and make him the Messiah? No. His followers are preaching that Jesus is both alive and doing miracles through them. But their power comes from Satan, not God. This is a dangerous sect, and I intend to eliminate it before it destroys our historic Jewish faith. You see, Saul was convinced that Jesus was not the Messiah, and that the followers of Jesus were spreading false information. And the church at that time was gaining momentum as the spread of the gospel occurred. Well, in our scripture today, in Acts chapter 9, Paul, uh, Saul, before he becomes Paul, he, he, he's on his way to Damascus in order to persecute Christians. You see, Christianity was growing in Damascus, but on his way to that city, Saul had an encounter with God, and that encounter changed everything. You see, Saul rejected Jesus as the Messiah, but Jesus did not reject Saul. God blinded Saul because he needed to show Saul that he was wrong. In his convictions, he was wrong. God had to get Saul's attention somehow, and I don't know about you, but causing someone to go blind is a pretty surefire way of getting somebody's attention. But but before Paul became physically blind, God knew that Saul 
was spiritually blind. So, so what exactly happened to Saul, who later became Paul? Well, he discovered that Jesus was alive after all. Jesus was not dead. And Jesus truly is the Messiah. In this moment, in this encounter with God, his eyes were open, and he realized that Jesus is alive and truly is the Messiah. And that changed everything for Saul. Well, later, as he became Paul, he wrote the majority of the New Testament, and he founded churches, and he led others in the spread of the gospel of Christ. Warren Wiersbe uh, states this as well as to what we read earlier. He says, the Hebrew of Hebrews would become the apostle to the Gentiles. The persecutor would become a preacher, and the legalistic Pharisee would become the great proclaimer of the grace of God. I don't know about you, but that's a, that's a pretty dramatic turnaround for Paul. Well, well, this story, it's great, and it's, it's good to look at, it's good to talk about, but what in the world does it have to do with us today? What does it share with us for us in 2022? Well, I, I want to take a moment and highlight what I think are three takeaways for us from this particular passage. Here's the first one. While, yes, this is an incredible recount of the story of a conversion of someone, it's also a story of surrender. Paul experienced both conversion and surrender in this story. He had an encounter with a living God in Jesus Christ. And when one encounters the living God, well, one can't help but surrender. That's exactly what Paul did. So, it begs the question, have you completely surrendered to God? Or are you still clinging to your old ways and to your old habits? When we surrender to God, God can do amazing things in us and through us. Just look at Paul. The second highlight I think we have in this Scripture for us today is that there's, there's a truth here for all of us and for everyone in the world today. And here's that truth. Even if you reject Jesus, Jesus will not reject you. See, there's room for us all at the table of the Lord. Uh, there may be uh, someone watching this today that, that you have rejected Jesus, or maybe someone you know, maybe it's a family member or a friend who, who's rejected Jesus. Well, the good news is Jesus has not rejected you or anyone else that you know that may have rejected Jesus. I mean, we, we may not have had an experience like Paul that has caused us to be blind, but, but each of us can have our own encounter and experience with a living God. And when that happens, radical transformation happens. And it's, it's our job as a follower of Christ to share that transformation with others, to tell others about what God has done in our lives. You see, we need to help others see and know that Jesus is alive and Jesus truly is the Messiah. Well, the third takeaway, I think, for us in this story is that this is a story of trust and obedience. In the sixth verse of this passage today, Jesus instructs Paul, and he says, Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. You know, Paul didn't have all of the details. He didn't know what was next and what was going to happen, but he trusted Jesus, and he obeyed his commands. And as they say, the rest is history, because Paul continued to follow, continued to trust, and continued to obey Jesus all the days 
of his life. Now, <clears throat> there's a, a potential danger here that we have to be very careful of, is that, and that danger is we could spend all of our time and all of our energy focusing on Paul. While this is an incredible account and witness of the faithfulness of one person, I think Paul would be the first one to say that he was simply a servant of Jesus Christ. He's not the one to be praised and worshiped. It's the one who caused the change in him and the one who led him to do incredible things for the kingdom of God that should be praised and worshiped. You see, when we follow God and when God allows us to do incredible things for the kingdom, we have to be careful not to receive all of the praise, but, but to point to the one who is at work redeeming and transforming each of us. You know, I'm a, I'm a fan of, of Broadway musicals. And there's a musical, it's, it's newer, even though it's been out for a little while, and maybe you've seen it before, and it's a musical called Wicked. Um, and if you don't know what this story is, let me give you just a really, really short um, summary of the, kind of the gist of the overall musical. It, it follows two characters, two unlikely friends that develop a relationship. And, and these two characters, the first is Elphaba. Um, also known as the Wicked Witch of the West. Uh, the second character is Glinda, also known as the Good Witch. Here are two people that are really unlikely to have any kind of a friendship, but their relationship grows throughout the show. And towards the end of the show, there's a song that they sing, and there's a lyric, a line in this song that really strikes me, uh, for our purposes today. And this is, this is what it says. Who can say if I've been changed for the better, but because I knew you, I've been changed for good? You know, I can't, can't help but wonder if, if Paul would say the same thing. Because he knew Jesus. He had an encounter with a living God, with a Messiah, because he knew Jesus. He was changed for good. So, what about you? And what about me? Even if we haven't had as dramatic of a transformation and a conversion experience as Paul did, can we say with assurance that because we know Jesus, we've been changed for good? And, and if we've been changed for good, then how are we going to change the world around us for good? God, we thank you for your love that is so evident in our lives, and we thank you for the faithful witnesses and those that followed you in the early days, and especially for Paul. We thank you that we have this recorded in Scripture to see the radical transformation that took place in him and the fact that he continued to point others to you throughout his entire ministry. And God, we pray that even as we walk each day, that we might live into the transformation in our own lives. And God, that we might realize that we truly have been changed for good, and that our job now is to help change the world around us for good. Thank you for Jesus and His sacrifice. And thank you for your Holy Spirit that works in us and through us, that we might be a beacon of hope and light for the world today. We love you and we praise you. We pray all this in the name of our Savior and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock 
and 1115 AM. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at RUMC.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at RUMC.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at RUMC.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Hi. Thank you for joining us. My name is Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Our mission here at RUMC is to help people live a Christ-centered life. We're a welcoming church, we're a biblical church, and we're a compassionate church. That the, we believe that the way that, that God made us, that he made us in his image. And what the Bible tells us is that his image is an us, is an our. When God said in the creation story, let us create humans in our image, he made us to be in community together. He made us to connect to him and one another. That's the place that this is at Roswell United Methodist Church, a place of community and faith. I want to invite you to join us. It might be online, it might be through social media, or it might be here in person. We meet at 9 o'clock in a contemporary service with a band. We also have two 1115 services. One is here in the sanctuary with a traditional choir an organ. We also meet at 1115 with a band in our chapel. Thank you for joining us, and I look forward to meeting you.